Welcome, action fans, and thanks for joining us for another edition of All 90s Action All the Time as we continue our Val Kilmer season. I'm one of your hosts, Scott Murphy, and on this episode of the pod, we are going to be looking at 1993's The Real McCoy. Before we get into that, though, I need to introduce my regular co-host. Yes, you know exactly who it is. He is a screenwriter. He is one third of the Bloodhound Picks podcast. And he is an incompetent would-be criminal looking to be taken under the wing of a crime legend. No, wait, actually, that's just Val's character in the movie. Uh, Got a little confused there. Uh, Anyway, it's Mr. Craig Draheim. (laughs) Glad to be here. I could not find a line that worked. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I watched the whole movie looking for a line specifically. I was like, "Where? Come on, give me a line. Give me a line to use with this." Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we'll talk about the excellent writing of this film uh, much more <laughs> as the episode goes on. <laughs> So it's understandable, yeah. Craig. I understand your pain. Now, because we are not covering every 90s Kilmer film, here is a quick catch up uh, as to what else he was doing in 1993. As he also starred as Doc Hollywood in Tombstone, which you can hear all about in our Tombstone episode that we did uh, in the, the Kurt Russell season, which was, which was last season. And he also played the uh, what is called the character is just called the mentor but you might know him as the kind of elvis character in true romance uh which is a film that we probably won't cover because it's more of a crime film than it is an action film but if you have not seen true romance i would definitely recommend that you do because it is quite possibly tony scott's best film now on to the background details for today's film which was released On September the 10th, 1993, it was directed by Russell McCahey, who has directed many features over the years in in horror and sci-fi and action. But the main thing you need to know about Mr. McCahey is that uh, he directed Highlander, and that is awesome. And the film was written by William Osborne and William Davies. uh, (laughs) Who's <laughs> Craig's laughing already? Who are the screenwriting duo who brought you "Stop" or "My Mum Will Shoot"? Uh, so, yeah, maybe. make up your own mind as to, <laughs> as to as to what we might be in store for here. Uh, review-wise, it is currently sitting at a five point five out of ten on IMDb. 22% on Rotten Tomatoes based on 18 reviews, no Metacritic score, and it has a 2.4 on Letterbox. It did not do any better at the box office as it was a complete dud, making uh, a mere $6.4 million off of a $24 million budget. Also, according to its IMDb votes, 8.7 thousand, uh, and the people who marked it as watched on Letterbox 2.5 thousand, it is the most obscure and least seen movie we have covered on the podcast, taking that title uh, from a Rapid Fire. Uh, further solidifying this fact is that it cannot be found on streaming and is currently out of print on DVD, but is available free on YouTube, which is exactly where myself and my co-host watched it. So, Craig, um, once again, much like the Thunderheart episode last week, I hadn't seen this movie. I hadn't heard of this movie. Had you? Um, well, first, I'll, I'll just say, Scott, that I think the I'm going to have the delay like we normally do when I'm up here doing that. So just wanted to warn you on that. But, okay, so I had actually not seen this movie before, and I don't even know if I've heard about it. I mean, there's so many um, 
real McCoy titles that in my head I was like, oh, maybe I've heard of it at one point, but yeah. No, not at all. And yeah, I was trying to find it and I was even like, well, maybe I'll just buy it because, you know, to try and support and stuff like that. And even to buy it, it was very difficult. It wouldn't be here in enough time. So yeah, (laughs) that is my only connection to real McCoy that I was trying to buy it so that (laughs) for this purpose. Yes. I also looked into buying it, but then I realized that all the DVDs were like secondhand and looking on Amazon, um, the DVD cost about 20 pounds. And I was like, no real McCoy. I'm, I'm not forking out 20 pounds for you. (laughs) <laughs> but thank you very much to the person who put it on youtube uh, so we could still do this episode or i mean you know <laughs> yeah. who knows maybe we shouldn't thank that person uh, given given the movie is not great <laughs> yeah <laughs> And there's not enough Kilmer. There, there's not enough Kilmer in this movie, uh, un- unfortunately. Although, I, I, um, I, reading about this movie, uh, apparently, this is one of the movies that Kilmer was was not best behaved on the set. Apparently, there was a point where he was not happy uh, with uh, Russell McKay's the way he'd set up a particular scene. So he fired off his prop gun into a prop car in a kind of hissy fit. And I saw an interview, um, I read an interview with Russell McKay, where um, he was talking about the movie uh, very briefly. The interview was mainly about the shadow. Uh, But um, he mentioned it and he said it was a tough shoot. And he mentioned that... um, one of the actors, who he would not name because he didn't want to get in trouble, made Kim Basinger cry. And I can only imagine, because I don't think the likes of, um, you know, Gaylord Sertain or, you know, whatever is, is it's like a big enough name to be like, oh, I will not mention that person. I can only imagine he's not mentioned it because it's, it's Val Kilmer. But maybe I am doing Val Kilmer a disservice. Um, I don't think so because even if you look at like, Terrence Stamp or whoever, yeah, no, I agree. I think. He, yeah, no, because really he, deliberately, he deliberately he deliberately mentions Bill Terrence Stamp as, as being like um, <laughs> great to work with. Like he mentions that Kim Basinger was a delight. That yeah. Terrence Stamp was a top pro, and like it was great to work with him. And then, yeah. And then he says that. So I'm like, oh, well, that's two of the three big stars in this movie talked about. Hmm. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It was the kid that played Patrick. He's the one that did it. It wasn't Kilmer. (laughs) (laughs) The the interesting thing about the kid is, I don't know if somebody on this film thought the kid was going to be like a big star at some point or whatever, but like in the credits, he is, um, he is credited as like an introducing Zach English. And yeah. Uh, but that kid didn't go on to, in fact, oh, yeah. that kid ended up uh, quitting acting and becoming an EMT. That's. Probably more noble <laughs> than being in the real McCoy. <laughs> <laughs> so he did some, you know, like, uh, you can say whatever you want about him in this movie, but he, d- he ended up doing some real world good. So, like, um, can't, can't shit on him too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's yeah. dive into this one, Craig. Let's not fuck about like we normally do. Let's let's yeah. let's get straight into it and um, tell us how this one starts, Greg. So this starts as we're seeing a city, which we come to find out is Atlanta, 
and then we kind of come to the uh, an Atlanta Atlanta bank, and we see somebody breaking in. And the whole time, the way it's set up, everything about it, you're kind of, you know, obviously spoiler alert. You're assuming that based on all the other heist movies that it's a man, and you know they're they're breaking in and trying to get into the elevator not by working the system but by pulling the panel out and just burning all of the circuits things like that and then there even comes a scene where this individual opens up the ceiling and comes through and the floor is lined with you know the the lasers that were very popular in heist movies or still are so they have to kind of crawl across the ceiling. But unfortunately, the alarm is triggered. And while they try to escape, they are apprehended by a police helicopter. And that jumps to six years later in a Georgia prison. And that's where we are introduced to Karen McCoy. Yeah, can I... Uh, I was just going to say something just quickly. I did watch, uh, I, I couldn't do much uh, research for this one. Uh, the, the trivia on this on IMDb is there's no, there is no trivia. There is one piece of trivia and it's not trivia. It's just basically <laughs> saying like, um, oh, uh, Kim Basinger was in Batman and Terrence Stamp was in Superman and Val <laughs> Kilmer was, was played Batman. So they're all in DC. For, that's not trivia. That's, that's just, Anyway, um, yeah. so there, there was just that, but I, I did find those, the Russell McKay interview, um, which mentioned it briefly. And also I found an interview on YouTube with Kim Basinger. And one of the funniest moments of that interview is like, she was saying she really got into character, uh, when she, she wore that cat suit. And that was uh, what really got into the, the character and the, the mindset of the, of the, bank robber but um because it is a heist movie um and apparently she was a fan of mission impossible uh when she was doing the scenes she said like in the back of her mind she was uh humming the the mission impossible theme tune to herself which i just i'm so amused by just imagining kim based dude on set just being like dun 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 Da, 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 da. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> no, that's great. It, I mean, it is very reminiscent of, of course, the which would then become, you know, the famous Mission Impossible scene that yes. is kind of known throughout all of the Mission Impossible movies. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Which would be three years after this. Yeah. 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 But that's um, a weird thing about this movie, I guess, before we fully get in, is mm-hmm. that like it, the 90s had these amazing kind of heist films. And, you know, you realize that it, it does a couple of things that came before these films that then would make it iconic, like Mission Impossible or whatever, and um, would like really, I guess... I put a stamp on it, but then it came after it, these other what I don't know. It's just kind of in the middle of all of these amazing heist films, and which also might be why it gets lost because there's, we're so much way better movies that came out before and yeah. after. I, it, it just feels very generic. Have you seen any of the, I, and also like it, it steals things from much. I mean, this is kind of skipping to the end, near the end of the movie, but it steals things from, from much better heist movies. Like, um, at the end, yeah. where they're doing the, the heist at the end, they use like a thermal lance, just like in, um, Thief. Uh, and it's like, oh, no, don't be referencing that. <laughs> when you're this movie, yeah. you can't be trying to yeah. compare yourself to that movie, cause that movie's great. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> also, like, um, kind of cutting back to the start yeah, of the it, movie, yeah. one the of the weird were... moments, <laughs> one of the weird mm-hmm. moments of the start mm-hmm. of the movie is that when, she, well, basically when 
Kim Basinger's character, Karen McCoy, gets her possessions back from the, from the jail, and you're like, oh, it's, it's played as this thing, this big thing of like, it's a woman! It, you know, because you've maybe not seen the poster and you're way into the, you know, cinema <laughs> or whatever. Um, oh, amazing! Um, and then the, secu- the, the prison guard um, gives her her stuff back, and then she said, he says, you know, before the facial reveal comes, uh, is like, is, is this condom yours? And it's, um, and then he says it's ribbed. And then she says, oh yeah, I must have been ahead of my time. And it was like, it's like, what in 1987 were people not using ribbed condom as much? Like, I don't, like, what it was going. <laughs> Right. Is she a trailblazer for for ribbed condoms. So like, <laughs> yeah. We need the answer if somebody listening to this episode was buying condoms in 1987. Let us know. <laughs> Please write in if you have this information. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we we won't uh, stay with that for too long, but um, I just thought I'd bring it up because I was like, that's that's weird. I, I I don't know if it's like she's suggesting that she's a trailblazer to have rib condoms, or she's a trailblazer to just be a woman who has the condom. Like usually the guy comes with a condom. Is that is that maybe what it is? Maybe she's a trailblazer. Nineteen eighty seven women didn't carry condoms, um, but she I- did. I think so. Yep. I probably thought about that too hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move well, on. But that's kind of the issue with... Yeah. <laughs> no, that's one of the issues because it's supposed to be kind of like a more lighthearted, fun heist movie and then it has tonal issues throughout which I know we'll get into but like, the character of McCoy I don't know is played she, there's kind of this blandness about it about the whole character but then there's these moments of you're watching it going oh, oh, oh like you could really kind of have fun with this a lot more than you are or than anybody in this movie is actually having <laughs> Like, why isn't anybody having fun with this movie? That's a fair point. And, like, she seems, in that kind of opening riposte uh, to that prison guard, and then in the next scene when she's kind of being sleezed onto by a guy in the train, uh, and she, she's just completely honest of being like, um, oh, I, you know, I was... Uh, you know, like uh, that she was robbing banks and stuff like that, which scares the guy off. Like both of those scenes, she's like, she's quite, uh, you know, a big personality, forceful, like you know, very much her own woman, kind of quippy, you know, sarcastic, all this, all this kind of stuff. And you're kind of like, oh, this is the character I'm, I'm getting. Okay, okay, this is a uh, a strong female lead, quippy, you know, like yeah, okay. Um, but then. Almost immediately after that, uh, you know, she becomes kind of this really soft-spoken and, you know, kind of meek character. And you think she's just doing that initially as like an, an act, like when she first meets her parole officer. But then she kind of interacts with other characters in that way as well, where you're just like, oh, OK, that's that's kind of weird because those characters like can't do anything to you like put you back in jail or anything like so then it becomes like this thing of like oh this is the character now and the the character is that for a while uh, until the third act when she becomes um kind of wisecracking and uh, badass again and you're like oh Uh, so yeah yeah, it goes up and down throughout the movie yeah I mean, well, Stop Her My Mom With Shoe, obviously, you know, anybody listening just listened to us talk about that episode. I don't want to rehash all that trauma. But, you know, <laughs> obviously, I don't know, that one, I think, was more, 
was more consistent in terms of what like it was trying to be a comedy yet yeah, you know it failed about it but yeah i just i think that's my major issue watching this movie is that um like executive decision as much as we we joke about that it's you know the the ultimate three star movie that then is for you know is forgettable and that's um this one it's like while watching it i was forgetting i could even forget the scene that happened immediately before it just ends up becoming like so kind of all over and yeah like the executive decision comparison is interesting because yeah this this film is kind of bland and 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 flavorless whereas um executive decision is kind of um tense and interesting while you're watching it it's just when, by the time you get to the end of the movie you know like the next day you'll be like yeah yeah that was quite a good movie i i enjoyed that movie i can't really remember much about it but like yeah, it was quite a good movie. Whereas this, it's just kind of like, yeah, you know, c- completely for- forgettable. So like, yeah, well, the likes of executive decision is, is like an enjoyable tense watch in the moment. It just doesn't stick with you for that long. Whereas this, yeah, it doesn't stick with you even while watching it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. So. You get to meet Val Kilmer. It ends up becoming P.T. Barker or J.T. Barker, sorry. And while did you know really say that you ended up being P.T. Barnum? <laughs> I said P.T. Barker, but okay. uh, it's uh, J.T. Barker. Yes. Yeah. Okay, J.T. Barker. That is correct. Yeah. But he's trying to rob a convenience store. And he's obviously really bad at it. And, you know, the clip is falling out. And because the clip falls out, the cashier is able to pull a gun on him. And basically leading to JT or and like, dra- quickly driving away as, you know, McCoy is kind of chuckling about it because of how horrible of a robber he is. But... Yeah, that's, it's interesting again, because with that character, you think he meets up with her, you know, again, going forward later and you're expecting, oh, this is going to be where she's kind of training them or they're really working together. But that's kind of the end of that element. I mean, next time she sees him, it's not like she's ever really taking on him under her wing, like you would expect with another, um, type heist movie. You're just kind of like, oh, okay. So now he's. A little more competent of a robber, I guess, and but it's not really necessary. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that that's that's true. I mean, he is completely incompetent throughout the movie. Basically, he is very much the the comic relief. I like I like how Kim Basinger described it in her interview, where she's the guy and he's the dumb blonde, and I'm like, you know, that's kind of true. Yeah. Oh, and it's fun. I wish they leaned into that even more than they do. And it, and I even like the fact that, you know, obviously in Hollywood, um, you know, you have two people, they'll be playing roughly the same age that they're supposed to, but you find out, you know, the guy is, the actor is 40 and the actress is, you know, 25 or whatever it is. But in, you know, in this sense, um, two years older, I think, than Kilmer. And so it, you know, for that instant, you know, being a 90s movie and an action film and having that, that's kind of, you know, a weirdly unheard of thing, even though it might sound like, oh, well, that's, that shouldn't be a problem at all, but especially at that time. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's true. I, I, um, I, I think, yeah, you, yeah, you're entirely right. Um, that, uh, Kim Basinger is slightly older than, um, Val Kilmer. 
Kim Basinger would have been um, 40 when this movie came out, and uh, Val Kilmer would have been uh, 34. Yeah, there she's so she's about six years older. And I don't know. I like there's, that's the hard part. Is obviously I'm I'm trying to be optimistic before we get into this movie fully <laughs> and give it more of the benefit of the doubt, which you can't. But like there's there's a lot of setup again. I. I'll repeat myself that that they could have had a lot of fun with, and I think you know, like having like playing more into the, the fact that JT or into kind of I don't know, it just there is kind of a movie in there that could have been good, I guess, with different writers or whatever it may be. I'm going to pull out a. Uh, um, instance later when we get to the the police officers with the bank that I haven't pulled out since um, early in the Stallone season of the movie that I'd rather watch, you know, the side characters movie. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, yeah, we've not had that in a while. So I, I, I look forward to that. Um, but um, there is... Yeah. There is a few directions this movie could have gone, but it can't seem to decide uh, which of those uh, to to actually yeah. do. So kind of uh, oh yeah, so on the the mini mart thing, like when he has the mini mart robbery, before we kind of move away from that scene, the the thing I noticed was the 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 kind of shop clerk, like his handgun is massive. I was like, what the yeah. fuck? Why? <laughs> yeah. I was like, that is more has, firepower like, than you require, my gun. man. <laughs> but anyway, that that's all I wanted to say about that. It was just <laughs> yeah. No, um, so yeah, next. So what we pretty much get after this point of the amateur is you find out that her ex-husband is now remarried, and she's asking about her son, but he quickly hangs up the phone, and he said he's going to meet her the following day to give her, her, her um, all of her belongings, and then. You kind of get into that. You get into her needing to find a job, but she, you know, meets her horrible parole officer who's obviously playing the creep card and he's, you know, being rude to her about, well, why didn't you come in earlier, even though it was late at night and I can send you back as quick as possible and, and all this stuff. And while she's meeting the parole officer, that's when, again, we're introduced to, we're finally kind of introduced to JT who starts kind of fanboying out basically about McCoy and he wants to basically be the like her sidekick says I can be your driver I can I can help you and then he ends up they kind of weirdly start partnering up just because she doesn't have any other option the bus went off without her and so oh well I can give you a ride to the place you need to go so that you can pick up your stuff. And that's kind of, that's kind of the relationship for a lot of it. And then even further, like he helps her get an apartment, but then again, they're really not connected in any way at all. There's really no romance between at least her to him. Um, but yeah, that's just for about the first 30 minutes or so of the movie that's basically it is that he randomly is showing up helping her and moving i guess the plot forward but really you know not really being of use as the character yeah yeah that, that's very true he's just kind of like yeah he is just there as a sidekick and there as um you know, to move the plot forward a, a little bit but um yeah, like he, yeah, he doesn't fit into the film quite in the way you you'd think he'd fit into the film. But then, like, that's because 
kind of after that point of like him asking questions and, and fanboying out, which is, I, I love how you phrased it like that because that's exactly what I put in my notes as well. Um, yeah. like <laughs> it's, yeah, after that and you're like, oh, right. Okay. We're, we're, we're here. We're in this kind of trying to be fun heist comedy got you i i know where i know where we are um but then after that point where he's asking questions then you get a montage of karen trying to find a job and it kind of for a while becomes like this kind of criminal reform drama of her trying to reconnect with her son and uh, like you know trying to do good and and it almost becomes this totally different thing of like, oh, okay, well, we know there's going to be a, a heist later because, like, that's because what we, I mean, if you just look at the poster, you, you know, it's like, this is a heist film, you know, so we know we're going to get back into that at some point. But for a while, it's just, and it's, it's really, you know, there's plenty of meat there if there was better writers or whatever, but the way it's done here, it's just really drags. Yeah. Well, and it even goes, I mean, you know, later the movie Heat, it's not even a major scene and not even a major character, but you think about there's that whole, um, I can't think of his name now, um, but he gets out of prison, goes on parole, and then ends up working as a, um, what is it, like a dishwasher and cook oh, for yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. the restaurant, and they ends up eating. Yeah. And it's, and it's this very small section in heat that isn't really connected fully to the plot at all. And yeah, it does, that small section does a better job than, you know, the, this whole movie and dealing with it. <laughs> yeah yeah no i i would agree with that absolutely um and uh but anyway we we roll on with the film we find out yeah. that um roy uh karen's ex-husband is a complete asshole like there is a scene with him talking to an accountant and the accountant's like well you know like i can't really you know, you're going broke and I can't really do anything. You know, we're getting this tax on it. It's just, it's going to be bad, man. And it, there's a bit where Roy, you know, he saw it, the accountant's talking about the staff and Roy goes, screw the staff. And then two minutes later, after, after it's like, you think like, oh, what an asshole. What a terrible boss. And then, yeah, just a couple minutes later, he informs Karen that uh, he had told Patrick that she had died. And we're just like, well, fuck this guy. Yeah. And the weird thing about, so in this scene, is again, and it'll pop up in my notes several times, is that then Patrick comes up to the two of them while they're talking. And the Patrick knew her up until he was three years old and she was in prison for six years so but apparently he has no idea what his mom looked like at three i don't know um anyways i won't get into all that but it i don't know it's weird because there really isn't enough tension or enough riding on it throughout the movie for her not to tell patrick that she's his mom it it never feels like oh well she just can't because of blah 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 you know these series of things it's just she says she can't because the script tells her not to but <laughs> pretty much yeah the the scene plays kind of awkward yeah yeah the one thing that is good in this scene is when Karen punches Roy and you're like yeah he deserved that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing that I noticed as well, like, um, yeah, that's a, uh... the other thing that I noticed was that throughout the movie, everybody, most men that she meets, all men that she meets are sleazy to her. And everybody comments that like, uh, that she hasn't lost her figure, 
like as if that's like a big surprise of like oh you kept your finger in jail that's that's real impressive like the, the most impressive thing a woman can do yeah exactly and i don't know, and it becomes in especially now that we're about to get into Terrence Sam who is in kind of his introduction yeah it's this big thing where you just really not um like he even looks at her longingly and there's speculation that well did they have something before and I, yeah I don't know it's it, yeah all the men in this give off very rapey vibes and creepy vibes and that's the and that's basically what they're there for any interaction with her is that except Kilmer's kind of but even he obviously he, He's in love with her, but because he's in love with her career type of thing, you know, yeah. again, fanboying out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's clearly attracted to her, but not in a kind of creepy, sleazy way. And the weird thing about it kind of is that even though the, the movie pushes back against that, you know, the character of Karen, you know, punches out Roy um, and like she kind of talks back against some other men who are sleazy to her, including that early scene on, on the train where she scares a guy off by telling her she was a bank robber. Um, there is other times where the movie and like her character, like don't react to it. And, you know, like they, every time somebody says like, Oh, you, you've not lost your figure. Like that never, like she never says fuck you to anybody or like, uh, or like his sarcastic back. It's just, it just sits there and then we move on to whatever else we're, we're talking about. And this like, and it kind of felt awkward each time because it's yeah. like, you keep expecting her to be like, well, we, you know, fuck you. What, what's the matter if I kept my finger? I was in jail for six years, you fucking dick. Yeah. But in the, I don't know, it just plays into, the element, it's just this movie it feels like for a heist film should be longer but then w- watching the movie like there's so many lines in this that you could just cut because they're just throwaway it's like oh you're just again like you were just saying um yeah you have these lines talking about her figure that then just sit there but they don't really move anything forward they don't they're just letting us know that it's kim basinger who was kind of this um you know sex icon at the time or you know or sex symbol i guess yeah yeah for sure um what we didn't mention is uh about the introduction of jack of uh, terence stamp's character is at this point in the movie uh because like he loses it later on in the movie but at this point in the movie as much as I admire and, and, and love Terrence Stamp in many, many films from Superman to, to Priscilla Queen of the Desert and, you know, like loads of the, the limey, you know, I recently, uh, yeah. I rewatched that earlier on in the year. He's great in a whole bunch of things, but he is doing a truly, truly, truly terrible Southern accent. I, I'm glad you say this because my first thing I wrote about him. And yeah, no, I agree. I like him in the limey. I actually, <clears throat> I love Priscilla Queen of the Desert, but I was like, man, so it, and I kept like putting my ear to it and turning the TV up of you know, like, am, is he doing a Southern accent or not? Because it keeps fading in and out and it seems like he's unsure about doing it at times. <laughs> I mean, oh, he's so, what is yes, going and- on here? I feel like there's moments where, Yeah, oh, you could go. I absolutely agree. Um, so in this golf club scene, he is doing like a horribly corny, like oh, I'm a southerner kind of like accent. Um, but no, it comes in and out, and like by the end of the movie, he's clearly given up on it. By the third act, he's clearly given up on it, and he's just like Cockney by the end of the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, at it, it, the start of the movie, he's all kind of like, actually, I'm just in real estate now. And by the end of the movie, he's like, I'll fucking get you. 
Yeah. He's just, he's like the limey by the end of yeah, everything. He's, he's totally, he's like a fucking, I was terrible yeah. at this all along. I probably shouldn't have bothered. <laughs> Well, because obviously, you know, as everybody knows, that Georgia is, you know, is right next to you know, one inner city London or whatever. <laughs> they're they're like right, they're the same region basically. Yeah, yeah, they're real close. They're real close. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the West End of London and and like you know, or the or the east the east end of London and uh, and in Atlanta, they're really. Really, just border each other, really. Um, so lots of lots of Southerners and, and Cockneys mingling. So that's how he's got that yeah. that weird um, weird accent. Um, oh, talking about Georgia, I you know because I always think of Kim Basinger as very Hollywood actress. I did not realize that um, she was born in Athens, Georgia, and and is a is Southern. Oh, I didn't know that either. Yeah. So there you go. It's just one of those weird things. You know, she just seems very California. It's actually Southern. Just like Burt Reynolds, born in Michigan, but, you know, like I, I always thought, like Georgia, because he's the <laughs> most Georgian, Georgia man. The, when you watch all his films, and then you find out not actually a Southerner. Amazing. Yeah. Well, films lie to us, Craig. That's what yeah. happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If we've learned anything from the real McCoy, <laughs> it's that films and actors are liars. <laughs> They're all liars. Yeah. That's right. Anyway. So- uh, I can't even remember. Oh yeah, no, yeah, right. Yeah, the- I know where we I know where we were at. Um so we cut we cut forward. Um Jack's apparently not interested. He's in real estate now. Um and you know, so like when JT comes in, over to him um, he says, No, I'm not I'm not planning anything uh, to don't bother with this Karen McCoy. Um I'm legit. Uh, so, but then just after that, because clearly he still is in criminal enterprise, uh, one of his one of his henchmen, uh, played by Rainer Shine, um, is uh, who's one of those character actors who just pops up and loads of things, but like uh, you always recognize his face, but you don't know his you don't know his name. Like I had to look up on IMDb. I was like, I know that guy. He's been I've, I've seen that face before. Um, he threatens Karen. Uh, but then he swiftly gets a knee in the nuts and um, that's kind of deals with him and she just walks away. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, after yeah. that, like... Um, As she's watching, yeah. <laughs> you go, Greg. Oh, no, you keep going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I was just saying, yeah, the... No, it's just funny because, you know, she's sitting there watching Patrick for the, the whole time. And it's just so quick. Again, going into maybe this being kind of lighthearted and more slapstick, but it's it's not even like there's a threat about the fact that he just, he's showing her that he has a gun and is pulling a gun on her. She just handles it, throws the gun away, and then just walks off. <laughs> yeah. For, yeah, for sure, for sure. It's it, like I think uh, that's one of the a main one of the many problems in the movie is is like there doesn't seem to be any stakes. It, it all seems kind of so low stakes yeah. that it's like, oh, I mean, she's going to win. She's clearly the smartest person in this film, so and the most capable person in this film, and she can run rings around all of these characters. So I don't feel like. Yeah, yeah. There's just no threat there. Yeah, even when we get toward to the ending, and there's you know, obvi- you know, not to spoil all of it until we get to that point, but there's a twist which you can kind of see coming at the end. Um, and you're like, wait, none of the characters in this kind of heist movie were expecting this twist, and then. 
don't know. It just plays so quickly. And yeah. And obvi- you know, obviously we'll talk about more when we actually get to it, but. Yeah. 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 But we'll, we'll cut back into where we are in the movie. We might have lost track a little bit, but I'm, I'm back. I'm back and right in my, in my notes of where we are. Uh, JT uh, takes Karen on a, a kind of quasi date where he's like, Oh, I know this really cool restaurant that is, is just the best, the best restaurant. And, you know, like, and you know, you need something to eat, don't you? Um, and then we cut to, um, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's an all right gag. We cut to, um, like, a, like a, a cheap kind of diner as, is, is, is what we cut to where they're, they're eating hot yeah. dogs and fries. Although, I did notice on the back wall of this diner, there was a sign that said the best hot dogs in Atlanta. So <laughs> I, I don't know if this is a false claim, but maybe, maybe this is, is not this, as low quality as, as we think it is. Cause apparently it's got the best hot dogs in Atlanta. So I, I will say as somebody that comes from Michigan, with Coney dogs and, you know, lives, has gone to Chicago, you know, with the hot dogs there. I have never heard of Atlanta being known for hot dogs, but that could just be me. <laughs> yeah. I, like even as somebody from, from the outside in Scotland, like um, it's, it's not, cause I know that like, uh, like Chicago is like famous for like the, like the chili dog and, and stuff like that. Right. Am I wrong in that? Um, <laughs> Chicago has. We're gonna <laughs> get into hot dog talk. Damn you, real McCoy! No, Chicago has this. Uh, I forgot their hot dog has like, relish. I think peppers and tomato or some. There, there's a certain type of Chicago dog. I know Michigan. Oh, okay. It's the Coney dog, which is chili onions and mustard there's yeah each for some reason oh is the the chili dog more of a michigan each thing state then. has like a this is the best hot dog or, um sometimes but then other states have them too i don't know they're okay. all it's weird <laughs> okay cool hot dogs are a weird topic of <laughs> that every, yeah ah uh, okay okay <laughs> Now this movie is so gripping. We're talking about hot dogs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, dear. We'll, we'll roll on forward. Um, so yes. after that point is when, um, basically Karen is, is fired from her job and um, because they find out that uh, she she's an ex-con the person who hired her for the job like put in their application that she was just self-employed to kind of do her a favor but then the boss found out while checking the social security number and then yeah and it, the parole officer who I, i'm not sure if we mentioned is played by gaylar sartain who was also in stop or my mum will shoot and always also in the Patriot, so it hasn't starred now in three of our seasons. Uh, and he is being sleazy to her again and kind of blackmails her into having a date, uh, for, for drinks. Um, and he drives yeah. her out to a big couch. Yeah. Sorry, Craig. Yeah. I'm here. I, I thought you wanted to say something there. Oh, no. Okay. Um, so the, the, the parole officer, Gary, uh, drives her out to a big house. And wouldn't you know, um, the house is owned by Jack, Terrence Stamp's character. And if you did not see this coming, you have maybe not watched a movie before? Yeah. <laughs> Well, and then um, up until that, our JT also brings up Jack, which then she says for JT to never talk to her again and all that. But the way JT brings it up is is that more of like a, a that he's naive about it because he's like, oh, these are good people to work with. Like it can help get you money. 
And when she says that, you know, Jack's the reason I was even went to prison, then, you know, he didn't know anything about it. So he's kind of, they show him as that he's weirdly innocent of it, even though, yeah, he, yeah. um, even though kind he's of kind of that related to Jack because he's like a nephew or something. Jack, but Jack doesn't like JP at all. Yeah. 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 But then we are at Jack. Oh, that's another thing I was going to mention. The scene in Jack's house uh, when it's it's kind of really oh my oh my goodness it's it's Jack's house. Um, when he is talking to Karen, just before he starts talking to Karen, there is another woman there who is who's a young woman, and uh, we're supposed to think that she's some sort of gold digger hussy because she's dressed like that in the way that movies think that gold diggers dress. And then uh, basically Jack is incredibly rude to her and throws her out because in 80s and 90s action films, to prove that your villain is villainous, he's either incredibly rude to a woman or is physically violent with a woman um, just for kind of no reason other than being like, God, this guy's evil, isn't he? Yeah. Well, and, you know, obviously the most, one of the most famous ones of that, that is kind of, you know, satirizing it is, you know, Robocop, of, you know, with the line, bitches leave. And so. Yeah. But that's what it feels like in this, you know, with this movie too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but this this movie does it unironically, and you're just kind of like, yeah, really, guys, you know, like, you know, screenwriters, man, you know, have more imagination of like, there's other ways, there's other ways to prove that your villain is an asshole or he's really evil or whatever, other than them just being abusive to women, you know, it's, uh, uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, mov- they should on, make a movie where the villain it's like just the nice <laughs> yeah. uh, so they should make a movie where the villain is just incredibly respectful to women <laughs> like he's just the kindest person to women yeah yeah maybe like Peter Fonda's character in the Lamey, he's quite he's quite decent to like um the person he's going out with. Yeah. See? There we go. There we go. Well done, Steven Soderbergh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, all the all the acclaim so, that Steven Soderbergh has got over now? his career is nothing compared to the praise yeah. he has just received on this podcast, which I'm sure he is thrilled about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we should get on to his next movie poster or on his autobiography. Well done, Steven Soderbergh, says all 90s action all the time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. Okay. Uh, enough fun and laughter. Let's get back to the movie. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what we find out is that she ends up declining and leaving, and then that she gets a call from Roy saying that or with Roy saying asking or no Roy comes sorry comes to her house he barges in and he's upset with her and saying that why would she take Patrick and it turns out that somebody came to the school because obviously this is the 90s when this was possible because schools didn't have you know right apparently safety procedures for their children um that somebody just came in saying that she was uh, Patrick's mother and took Patrick from school. And so that leaves basically uh, 
McCoy off trying to find where Patrick is at, and she ends up breaking into was it Jack's house and goes through it and doesn't really all she finds is that you know somebody's watching porn and somebody and Jack is watching I think a western or something. He's but watching no, Scarface. Patrick isn't there, and then she breaks him. Yeah. No, there like, we go. because that's, that's what criminals do. They, they watched, he, like, Jack is like, um, it's, it's like an episode of Cribs. He's just, he's just, he's just sitting watching Scarface. Yes. <laughs> and then, um, so she ends up breaking into her parole officer's house. And for somebody that is such, uh, an amazing kind of thief and, I don't know. She is a horrible person at breaking into houses because she makes it so she, there's the one place she busts the window with a brick. She like breaks open the door with the crowbar. It's like she is not stealthy at all in this, but she finds out that the, the parole officer is at his, I guess his cabin in, you know, a little bit outside of the city near some lake and so she drives out that way which then luckily for the script and for her there happens to be in the middle of the night in this kind of you know rural town an older man where he lives yes an elderly uh uh like um Guy who work, you know, like, uh, works at the petrol station, a uh, kind of petrol pump attendant, um, is is there, you know, because this guy he pumps petrol twenty four hours a day, clearly, and um, yeah, yeah. He, he's there Which to, to be like, no, oh, Gary, yeah, Gary just lives down the road. Um, that's my terrible southern accent, which, to be fair, is is no more terrible than Terrence Stamp, so I, I think I get away with it. No, I actually think your southern accent is better than Karen's. <laughs> well, thank you, Craig. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, she so she ends up watching the the house, and then and the more goes over to the house, breaks in with a brick. Um, and then ends up finding Patrick, who's just kind of laying on the bed, and he's not even really at no point that talks about he likes being a hostage. <laughs> he just like apparently gets to watch TV and like you know not be in school and whatever. Um, but she yeah. gets him, gets to the car that is a horrible car. Um, you know, for obviously script reasons. And at that same time, the same, yeah, guest attendant who was working last night is somehow working in the morning to tell Gary that a woman was looking for Gary <laughs> and went out to his house. Again, because the plot says so. I think the... The thing I, I find most hilarious about this scene, and the thing I really like about this scene, actually, is that I've put in my notes that uh, Patrick knows his dad's an asshole because, like, there is a couple of lines yeah. where he's <laughs> like, oh, was there a ransom? And, and uh, Karen's like, no. And he's like, oh, good, because dad's broke. And then, like, the car breaks down, and he's he's like, oh, God, it's not one of dad's cars, is it? Yeah. Yeah, and the car happens to break down yeah, just enough time so that they could be right on the road when Gary is pulling up <laughs> to them. Like, they didn't get far at all. No, they didn't get far at all. Um, but the thing I wanted to mention about that, actually, was... So, I found this scene quite jarring. So, as we've kind of talked about... Uh, there's been these different tonal shifts of like, oh, it's kind of like a sad 
mother son drama. Oh, it's this light hearted crime caper, you know, like, and it's, it's kind of gone back and forth between these two things of like crime caper and you know, more you know, one you know, relationship, you know, drama, you know, whatever. Um, and it, that's kind of weird. And then this scene's like really jarring because it's generally had this yeah. lighthearted tone and then Gary just beats her up. And I'm not saying that he like slaps her across the face and then drags her into the car or whatever. He like full fledged punches her in the face like two or three times and then kicks her in the gut. And you're like, Jesus Christ movie, shit just got real serious and I don't know where this came from. Yeah, no, I agree. The fight later, I don't know. It just everything with Gary is playing, like you already said, on a different in a different movie. <laughs> because, yeah, he like hits her several times, and and it's not even played even like when she kicks or knees the other guy in the in the nuts, or there's other fight moments where. It still has that lighthearted fight element, but no, this is like full on. Uh, it's just a complete shift. The fight style changes. They make sure that you see blood. Like, yeah. yeah, it's a rough, it's a hard watch for that part. Yeah. Because like you say, yeah, I mean, there's, there's total comedy. Um, when she punches Roy in the face, that's, that's played for laughs. And then when she needs a guy in the nuts, that's played for laughs. And, and even when like the, like mini Mart attendant like pulls a gun out on JT and like starts shooting up his car, that's obviously, you know, played for comedy as well. But like this moment just comes out of nowhere and it's played way more seriously and it's way more nasty than the rest of the movie. And you're just like, why does this exist? Yeah. I mean, all, all it really does is to, because he could have, he already has a gun. So the scene, he could have just to capture her and take her back to Jack. He could have just held her up because she doesn't carry guns as she already discusses. But, um, that could have just happened. Like he holds her at gunpoint, then takes her, and yeah, for some reason, like they have to have the scene where he knocks her out to take her to Jack. <laughs> yeah, which then Jack is kind of weirdly nice about. Like Jack, as we'll get into it in a, just a bit now, like Jack lets her stay at the house. He's really nice with Patrick. As his hostage, he like it seems like Gary is just going off in, on his own doing these things. Yeah, very much so. It, it feels kind of off, but um, yeah. So after that, like uh, the kind of the, the blackmail is in, and like she's. She's on it now. She's got, you know, like, uh, it's just a uh, one last job, generic, <laughs> generic plot device. And, um, so she agrees to, to, you know, do, do the bank job. It, like, as much as we're kind of shitting on the script because I think it deserves it, uh, there is a couple of funny moments. And <laughs> one of them kind of comes up, uh, you know, just after this, uh, where, you know, Karen is like, um, wants JT to be her driver. So goes to visit JT at his house. And, um, we find out that JT has been stealing Betamax players. And she's like, well, nobody uses Betamax players. And, uh, JT retorts that, um, well, they do in Nigeria. Apparently, there Nigeria is the Betamax capital of the world, which is a line <laughs> that I genuinely chuckled at. Not many lines in this movie. I was like, oh, "That's funny," yeah. but like that was one that I was like, oh, "That's quite good." Yeah. No, and I wish because up until like, that point when she goes to get him, that. Like she's not really, or he's not really 
there, as we kind of talked about, he's just kind of in and out of the movie. He pops up occasionally to move the plot forward. But during scenes like that with him in the convenience store or whatever it may be, you're like, again, like there is a fun movie to be had if you let them kind of be together more <laughs> something, but it just doesn't, it doesn't give us enough of it and it doesn't really happen for them to like have that banter back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. And and one of the, one of the weird things as well is like, yeah, there's not that actually, you know, coming up is one of the, one of the few things, one of the few scenes that I think is uh, genuinely exciting. Like w- one of the only scenes that I think is, is genuinely exciting. It's like, it's got a kind of, uh, a, a, tension to it and it's well maybe not a tension but just like a, a like a funness uh, to it uh, and a real zip to it um that the rest of the movie doesn't have and you know that's when uh, jt and karen are are kind of checking out the time of how long it will take security to get from from where they are uh to the bank yeah. for like you know because they're now trying to plan the blank job and um yeah they, they want to figure that out to you know what the how quick they'll get there for for the call, and like um, JT's ripping through the streets, and it's it's shot quite excitingly, and it's all you know, and he nearly runs over a homeless guy, and it's it's all quite it's all quite fun, and um, yeah, it just has more energy to it than like any of the other set pieces, and it's just like, and it's not even there's not really tension to it because there's no there's nothing there's nobody trying to get them or any anything like that, but it's just got more pizzazz than pretty much anything presented on screen I think no I agree completely I mean that that is while watching the movie and that happening I don't know it was like the first 30 minutes of the movie felt really long it just kept feeling longer and longer than that happened like oh this might be okay maybe it was a slow rocky start but it's going to turn around now because this this part's actually really fun and yeah, but it's the peak. Then it goes back down. <laughs> there's there's another part in you know as part of the the bank heist itself that is you know it's a fun element. They kind of it goes a little bit long, but obviously we'll get into that <laughs> when we do. But no, I yeah I agree with you that I think. It, yeah, it's fun and it's because it's, it's a complete downpour and you're seeing them just kind of rip through the, the empty streets at night of Atlanta. Yeah. Absolutely. And one of the, one of the things I think is possibly one of the weirdest things about this movie is that you can say whatever you want about the films of Russell McKay in terms of like the quality you know it's, it's up and down like I, I love the highlander but, you know like you know whatever you know whatever movie it, it is yeah. whether it's a good movie bad movie what whatever like throughout his career you know he directed the first two highlanders he directed you know the shadow um he, you know he he's directed a bunch of other things i've not seen razorback or ricochet they're supposed to be good um i have seen the likes of silent trigger as you know like as well but all all the russell mckay films that i've seen apart from this one because of his music video background are really highly stylized and really kind of memorable visually, even if there is not an amazing movie, uh, generally they, they've got that. And this is the least stylish Russell McKay film I have seen. Yeah. Well, it's probably too one of the least, because I didn't realize it was the same director as Highlander. And I even think about, I mean, you know, people don't necessarily, you know, Highlander has so many kind of iconic scenes and moments and quotes and whatever, but even that, thinking about that um, stadium shot where it was all getting all technical now, but that dolly shot where it's just one, t- you know, one complete shot going through the stadium and up the mm. stairs and everything. And I mean, it's just the way it's shot. Yeah, it's incredible. And like, I wouldn't suspect think it was the same director at all from watching this movie like i thought for some reason 
I was like, oh, this is going to be one of those where it's like a kind of, you know, like we had with maybe Stop or My Mama Shoot or whatever it was where like, oh, here's this kind of one-time director that then maybe did a couple TV episodes after that. But, you know, it's been kind of, that's been their career. Yeah, I, I know what you mean, or, or one of those kind of very workman-like directors. Like, you know, Roger Spot is where they yeah. did Stop My Mama's Shoot. It's, it's very, yeah, he's he's very work, workman-like. I mean, I you know, I quite like the Bond movie he did, uh, Tomorrow Never Dies, but he's not, um, he's not necessarily highly regarded or anything. He is just kind of those kind of on-the-job kind of, you know, uh, goes uh, goes and does his thing and and um you know he's not known for a particular style or a particular he doesn't have a particular aesthetic or anything um whereas um yeah again you know he might be like a kind of b movie director he might not be the most critically regarded director but he certainly has a style he has a particular aesthetic you 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 kind of recognize or you know certainly you know i i've seen the first two highlanders i've seen the shadow i've seen silent trigger you know like these movies they, they have um they have a certain style to them a certain aesthetic that you're like oh okay let's and but this movie is just kind of visually very bland and flavorless yeah I agree. Uh, so um basically after getting a one bit <laughs> okay. of excitement. Uh, 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 yeah. Then we we get into her where she's being where she's kind of doing the grifting, right? Or where she's Yeah. She's, she's this doing is the what, in the back. I guess while I was forgetting, yeah, okay, well, yeah, I was forgetting while watching the movie. I <laughs> while watching the scene, I'm instantly forgetting what is happening as I'm just writing it down because I know it keeps kind of jumping back and forth because this grifting scene goes. It's like several steps where she goes in to look at the the bank vault, then she goes in. To open a savings account to get more information, then she goes in to open a checking account to drop off um, the remote control thing, and, and JT goes in at one point to drop off something, which we'll get into. And as during that time, we're also getting these kind of scenes where, like, you see JT, Patrick, and her just having a blast <laughs> at. Jack's house where they are technically hostages and shouldn't be having fun apparently but you know they're spraying each other with hoses or playing with each other in the pool or yeah I don't know (laughs) yeah I I mean it's kind of particularly ridiculous when uh, the the scene where JT is talking about his car to Patrick and and basically we get some kind of American propaganda of like the American muscle car is the best car that man has ever created. He doesn't say exactly that, but that's basically the message he's, he's, he's given us. So um, yeah, uh, apparently this movie wants to, a bit of uh, American car propaganda for yeah. you there. <laughs> um, uh, and um, yeah, yeah, and then um, he's like spraying uh, Patrick with the hose and then it becomes like this kind of family family day out. It kind of like, oh, okay, we're on vacation now. This, 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 this is like hanging out at Jack's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And every time there's one of those scenes, then you see Jack like in the background or whatever, just staring at her and staring at them. And you think, oh, something more sinister is going to happen. This might be building. Maybe he's going to double cross her, stuff like that. Um, it doesn't lead anywhere, obviously. But no. we're supposed to get the feeling like, yeah, he is. Because, like, yeah, this is a terrible, one of the truly terrible things about the movie. Jack is a really weak villain. And, like, Terrence Stamp puts in this really quite low-key performance that I think he's supposed to be he's I think he's aiming for like sinister, but it just comes off as kind of bored. 
The other thing that I liked about this sequence as well. I agree. Yeah. The other thing I was going to mention about this sequence is that just before the scene where with the water hoses and stuff, there's like a little um, computer montage where um, Karen is working at the computer and we like we see all these numbers and she's cracking codes and and doing all this, and um, it up until this point like she's worn sunglasses a bunch, but at no point did we think she was a glasses wearer. Um, for for her actual eyesight, but when she's doing this computer scene, suddenly she's got these these big geeky specs on, and you're like, ah, oh, she's intelligent now because you got the movie is telling me she's she's clever because she's got the big geeky specs. So I know she knows stuff. Yeah, <laughs> no, I had the same feeling about it because then. It's weird because during the heist part, there's when she, anytime she's using like the computer sequence stuff in the heist, the glasses somehow are magically on, but then aren't during everything else. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're basically just on for this computer montage and they're on for the classic heist movie scene that every heist movie has to have where a group of people stand over a blueprint. And usually this is one of the high points of a heist movie. And this movie fucks it up. It just makes it like, you know, this is, this is usually, you, you, this is usually where you get the, the, the you know, the, the meat of the characters and, and there's the, the height of the, the kind of quippiness and, and, and all that. This is, you know, this is your classic Ocean's Eleven type moment. It's very bing, bang, bomb, you know, like, you know, there's slick lines coming left, right and center, you know, and it's just like, yeah, a couple of people query Karen about the logic of her plan. She then explains that the logic of her plan is sound. And then everybody kind of goes like, oh, well, 18 million. That sounds quite nice. Yeah, I think we'll go with that plan. And you're like, God damn it, movie. This is a, this, yeah. this is a scene that you really needed to nail. For, you're a heist movie. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then it bring it introduces us to these kind of the I don't even know the the crew, the heist crew or whatever that we've never seen up until this point except a couple of them. And now they have these lines and they're like chatting with her and all going back and forth and have this kind of um rapport that seems like they've been Again, like, as you were saying, like in Ocean's Eleven, where they've been kind of all kind of working together to figure this out, and now they have it fully solved. But no, it's kind of you're like, wait, who are these guys? They just popped up, and they're, now they're, oh, they're just here to ask her questions so that she'll explain what they're going to do for the script's sake. <laughs> yeah, because she has planned everything, and she's done everything for the plan to work They've not set up anything. They, they they weren't part of like the kind of this back and forth of like going and back and forth into the bank. You know, we've never seen them before, apart from you know Rain of Shine's character, you know, and, and like Jack himself, and and we're just like, yeah, well, so these characters have not been established at all. We do not care about them. Clearly, they're not important because Karen has already done everything. She has already done everybody's job. So we're not even sure why we specifically need these characters. And even actually at the end of the heist, we're still not entirely sure why we need these characters. This heist could have been carried yeah. out by Jack, JT, and Karen herself. Like, it really... These... The other people, entirely superfluous. But... Yes, just so we can have the classic blueprint scene, we needed more bodies for that. Yeah. Because, yeah, no, I agree. Because even watching the heist, you know, obviously we're about to get into it, but watching the heist itself, you're kind of like, so really there's no part that requires a one person doing something at a time. It's like, okay unlatching the door and then kind of relatching it to make it look like there's nothing wrong with it 
okay, now drilling through the vault, which only takes one person and the rest are just sitting around. Yeah, there's not, there's never a scene where two people have to be doing something at the same time or anything. It's just all, they're just kind of there. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yep. So, um, yes. So, like, Karen... (laughs) Um. Yeah. The, Karen opens the checking. I've I've looked at my notes. Karen opens the checking account. This is the final part of the plan. Um. She she plants like a, a kind of little remote control car under a bin, uh, where she is opening a checking account, which happens after the blueprint thing. And um. So yeah, this is kind of when the uh, the, the the bank heist kind of kind of kicks kicks off like uh, basically um jack uh, searches searches karen they're all dressed up uh, jack uh, searches jt and then searches karen even though she doesn't carry a gun and everybody knows she doesn't carry a gun but he wants to search her anyway because apparently his mum told him not or somebody told him not to trust women he doesn't trust women this is what is, is, is what is, is what the case is yeah and then Gary reappears because, yep. you know, apparently somebody has to babysit Patrick. Um, so that is going to be uh, going to be Gary. And then we move on to them taking over the security place. Um, and I thought this was quite funny because, like, Jack knocks at the door and we see that the security guard is a wrestling fan. Because he is he is uh, in the middle yeah. of watching. Um, <laughs> the interesting thing about this is, even though um, WCW is headquarters uh, was in Atlanta, Georgia, um, he's watching WWF. He is, uh, which is uh, like yeah. um, I, I I'm I'm not sure about that. You know, like uh, maybe uh, I, presumably they just got the the rights to WWF or, or, or something. But that seems, I, I feel, I feel like that seems inaccurate. I'm sure if somebody was, was in Atlanta, they might be more uh, likely to be watching WCW. But anyway, that's, that's just the wrestling talk. The, the, the last thing I'll say about the wrestling is if you are a wrestling fan and you're thinking like, but what wrestling was he watching? He was watching a match between Crush and the Repo Man. Um, but that's, that's all on the wrestling chat, man. <laughs> Yeah. Well, no, I, yeah. And I like actually, so there is one thing that I wanted to go back on that I realized, again, it goes with kind of that fun element that thinks that makes you believe there's going to be more twists and turns than there actually are. But JT even goes into the bank to drop something off in the vault himself. And we, kind of know what's going to be coming with it but like when he comes out Rainer Shine is there asking like well what what are you doing in the bank basically and he says it's that fun illness saying well I wanted to close out my account I had 150, it's like $150 or something in my account. $156 it was. Yeah. Yeah. When you could, when we're going to be taking 18 million from it, it's like, yeah, but I didn't want you to have to split up my 156. (laughs) Yeah. Again, again. Within um, the 18 million. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Because again, uh, Val Kilmer gets the, the best lines in this film and uh, the kind of few yeah. funny funny moments in the movie section two that they they already explained so we're into the we're into the heist now uh, Craig and we basically they they take over the security office place they tap into the bank security cameras so they can change the cameras so it looks like there's nothing on them and then the Basically, Karen uses the remote control bin uh, to set off the alarm and uh, the police come uh, to 
to kind of search the bank uh, and find that there's nothing there. They do this uh, a bunch of times. We see this in kind of real time, it seems like. They said, uh, you know, like... (laughs) So they do this like three times and we kind of see it each time and it's kind of like, all right, okay, this is going on quite a long time. I, I agree. Yeah, it just... And it's already explained during the the kind of blueprint exposition scene. So every time they set off the motion sensor alarm, then they do a little bit more. Then they make it look like nothing's wrong, leave, set it off again. The cops come, the cops leave. They do a little bit more, and it keeps just doing that until, you know, finally the cops are thinking, well, just the the machine's just broken and so they go to which means they have to sit there and stay for the the remainder of the night while you know they're basically stealing the money from under them the cops are on you know don't suspect a thing yeah and this is part of the problem going into it and then we watch it i feel like this is part of the problem in the movie as well because like the cops who are there who like stay or you know her like so after the fourth time that there's a fourth false alarm that's when the three cops are like oh it's in the rules now we have to stay overnight now the problem with this is like these are three clearly keystone cops and it also feels like oh jack can be easily double crossed um so it really it means there's a real lack of tension throughout this kind of high sequence of just being like, well, I feel like it's going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the, again, uh, I hinted at it in the beginning and um, and bringing back the segment of watching a movie and wanting to see the movie focus on somebody else. Oh, the, I know which character now. Because we have these three cops kind of, yeah. You have these three cops kind of bickering with each other and not really listening and they're just you know and i was like oh this is actually more entertaining than the actual heist which is supposed to be you know so much fun and here i am just like oh yeah i'd rather just watch these cops kind of bicker with each other which says <laughs> something about the heist more than just the cops that no that that is true because like there's two like kind of really fun moments with these cops where like, um, first of all, when they're called out, they're kind of complaining, like, oh, God, fourth false alarm this night. And then, like, they come to the bank, and the same guy who complains about that is talking to the other two cops, and he's, like, you know, putting his feet up, and he's like, hey, so who's getting the coffee then? And both of the other cops kind of just sardonically look at him, and it, it dawns on them, oh, right, I'm I'm getting the coffee. And then that same character again, like there is a little hiccup in, you know, somebody kicks one of the wires loose. So the the real video of them in action, like doing the robbery pops up and then he's like, he sees that and then runs to tell the other two cops and one of them comes, uh, one of them comes through. Uh, but by that time, the wire has been put back in so that it just looks like nothing is happening on the screen. So then we get this kind of fun interaction of like, oh yeah, the disappearing robbers. And <laughs> so I can understand you wanting yeah. to watch these three characters more than the rest of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm glad I'm not alone in this. <laughs> not, not at all. Not at all. If, if, if uh, yeah, I, I, I want to see these Keystone cops like uh, solve, not solve more mysteries. <laughs> They're just uh, the most yeah. incompetent. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Um, you know, because they're, they're not even like I, I'd like that of being like the kind of running theme of their movies. That they're not even like incompetent on the level of like a clouseau that and accidentally stumble yeah. across the answer. They're like so incompetent that they're just like uh the crowns just pass them by. Yeah. No, I like that idea. <laughs> 
Ah, <laughs> uh, they make Clouseau look like Sherlock. <laughs> ah, but then, then we have to cut so then, back to the actual the real, movie that's going the real on. Fun is that. <laughs> but yeah, so they are drilling through the vault, and they finally they get through again, pretty easy. They crack the safe code with all the the computer again, pretty easy. And then they go into the vault and they start kind of taking the money. They take a couple bags out and then she asks secretly JT to tell her which um, kind of safety deposit box was the package he put in at. So she opens it up. Take uh, It reveals that it's a gun, which she takes out and you're kind of like, you know, Jack, all of them, nobody's suspecting a thing, obviously, because why would they? And they all stay behind the, they're all kind of taking the money in this, what, the sub, the other section of the vault, which then she uses the remote to shut the gates, trapping them inside the vault with her and JT on the outside. And again, I don't know, there's, you saw the double cross coming. There's really no tension about it. There's yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's I, I love there. how <laughs> I love how relaxed this heist is. Because like so as we mentioned, um the drill they use is like this kind of uh thermal lance, uh, just like in Thief. But obviously in Thief that's a, a highly intense sequence you can you know you, you practically you know sweating watching it you know you're on the edge of your seat and this you're not on the edge of your seat at all because one it's so easily done and two we kind of cut keep going back to to looking at karen and jt and jt obviously thinks it's a picnic because he he has brought coffee um he's a, he's just like oh, like and they're so they're just like back there with karen's computer yeah. sipping some coffee like you know like it's a day at the beach and there's just no tension to it at all they're, you're you're not yeah, you know, you're laid back in your seat. You're not. You're nowhere near the edge of your seat. <laughs> yeah, no, I I agree completely. <clears throat> I also love that. Um, you know, JT is shown to be completely incompetent throughout the movie, and the only thing he can do is drive because, like, he doesn't remember anything because he had to write the number of the safety deposit box on his arm, and then also he he didn't uh, he didn't load the gun. Um, so it's, he's just a conf- it's it's a wonder that Karen even puts up with him to be fair yeah no, and that's again one of the other few funny moments is she's yelling at him about not loading the gun he's, he treats in such a like, straightforward way of like well you didn't tell me to load the gun you just told me that he get to buy the gun or something like that <laughs> oh dear yeah yeah um, and as we mentioned earlier but yeah uh, so Oh, you can go. <clears throat> oh, I was just going to say, as we mentioned earlier, by this point in the film, uh, Terrence Stamp has completely given up on the southern accent, and he's just when he's <laughs> when he's shooting the the gun at Karen, he's just like, "I'll get you, I will get you." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, again. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, they they don't get any of the money and they just run out, which JT again gets shot, which is something that doesn't hold any weight because it's like he's shot. You see that he's bleeding, but then it doesn't really pop up again. and He's perfectly fine. And then they um, gas the three cops and they escape. And yeah, then they head to Jack's house to get Patrick. Yeah, and I, I suppose this sequence is quite fun, even though, again, the way everything happens is so obvious. So, like, uh, JT uh, rams Gary's car, like, they've got a van, uh, JT rams Gary's car uh, with the van through a fence. And you're like, oh, well, you know, we've seen earlier um, a couple of times that Jack owns a tiger. So clearly he's been rammed into the tiger enclosure. And then, like, obviously, like a, um, like a, a scene or two later, 
uh, we see like Gary confronted by the tiger as if it's like a surprise, like, oh, right. Yeah. Remember the tiger? Yes. Of course. I remembered the tiger. You pointed out a few times. It's, yeah. it's clearly where this would, it just makes sense. Like, um, I've seen movies before again. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the, so the tiger lunges at him, but you don't see anything else. You just assume that it got him or he's dead or whatever. And then they search through the house looking for Patrick, but they search through, it feels like multiple times or something because then they both come across the same door and there's blood leading up to it. So somehow Gary fought the time in the amount of time it took them to find where Patrick might be. Gary crashed through the fence walked through the tiger's kind of area, fought the tiger, and then made it back up to the room without them knowing. To yeah, apparently so. Get Patrick and hold him hostage. Yeah, and yeah, you think he would have sp- they, they would have spotted him. You know? I mean, he's covered in bloods. So, yeah. Um, you know, he's he's got a big gun. Um, you know, I don't want to fat shame anybody, but Gaylord Setain is, 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 is a big guy. You know, um, uh, probably two hundred and fifty pounds. I would, I would say, maybe. I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, anyway, he's he's a, he's a big guy. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm just saying, you notice him, and um, yeah. So uh, it, it seems weird, but uh, yeah, Gary manages to out stealth them. And uh, have Patrick held at gunpoint, and then like Gary fights Karen again. Oh, well, last time he didn't fight Karen, he, he's punched her in the face a bunch of times, um, into disturbing effect. And and you know, I, again, he just there's there's no pulling punches when it comes to Gary. Um, I, and but at least this time, she she shows some kind of. Uh, Kind of karate moves that she really hasn't uh, sh- uh, shown before, but yeah, like she she kicks him a bunch of times, and then manages to get his uh, shotgun from him, yeah. and then just smashes him with the shotgun. And again, this is played way more seriously and way more darkly than anything else that's happened in the film, apart from the scene where Gary punched her in the face a bunch of times. Yeah, and there's no. You know, and so it's weird because it's not the type of movie where it seems like it's lighthearted enough that they're not going to kill anybody. But I don't know. Then that scene, it, it becomes one of those she just kind of knocks Gary out. Yeah. In the same way that, like, okay, so you left Jack and all of them. But, well, then what? I don't know. It, it doesn't really seem like she really, for somebody is great of a thief as she was and a criminal and all that she's not really thinking all this stuff through <laughs> no it, and again it kind of all feels like all oh, because the plot said so she, she's as, as smart as the plot wants her to yeah. be at certain points and as dumb as the plot wants her to be at other points yeah Exactly. They get Patrick and they basically they are on the run and Roy we see that Roy kind of overhears that there was an attempted robbery at the bank and two people got away which they um, are suspected of having some of the money and so he hears this and he ends up talking to Karen on the phone where she says, I have Patrick and I can bring him to you and at the airport. And then her and JT are going to go, basically, they're in disguise. They're going to go, like, you know, flee the country. And w- right before she's going to dra- dra- drop off Patrick. But they see that, you know, they're wanted and the cops are there kind of searching for them, even though they're in disguise. And so, he goes for some reason, even though she's dropping off Patrick, 
JT takes Patrick um, away, and then Karen goes to meet up with Roy, which it seems like it would be switched because I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, again, the, the the plot says so because it's more convenient for what for what happens. And also, we should mention at this point. Um, oh no, actually, no, that's that's uh, that that comes up in a, uh, in a minute. You know, uh, <laughs> sorry, some of the scenes get confused in my mind, even even reading the notes because like uh, not memorable. But anyway, um, yes, y- yes. Yes, so like yes, it feels like that should be the other way around. But yes, in terms of plot convenience, it is um it's that way around. Um because what happens next is that Roy, thinking that she has uh, the money from the bank, uh, attempts to rob her because his um car business is going under and um he, he's broke and he, he needs the money. And so he, yeah, he tries, he tries to rob her. He, um, you know, you mentioned earlier that obviously, um, no safeties in schools in the nineties. Um, Roy has managed to get a gun through the gates into a departure lounge in an airport. Um, so obviously, yeah, yeah <laughs> no security whatsoever in the nineties anywhere, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess not. Um, yeah, it was a different world, man. It was a different world. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, thankfully, <laughs> because characters are exactly where we need them to be at any particular moment, JT is yeah. in the bathroom um, to punch out Roy. Why? I, I don't know if he just stopped for a pee or if he knew that Roy was going to attempt to rob her or or if Karen managed to give him a secret signal somehow across the airport. I don't know how this works, but basically because we need a happy ending and we need to wrap this shit up, that's, that's what happens. Yeah, and then um, again, so you're kind of up until that scene, there's a scene right before that we kind of, that really isn't important at all but we um i guess kind of fits with the ending is that he's saying well you just need jt keeps telling her you should tell patrick your his mother and she didn't want to bring patrick with them as they flee the country because she's like well this is the first choice i actually get to make for patrick and so i want him to have a normal life and so on and so after he punches out roy they then go meet back up with patrick and and like JT's basically had enough of it where he finally just goes, all right, your mother's alive. She's your mother. You love her there. Let's go. <laughs> or something. <laughs> and that's how you actually, yes, we should mention that because like, of, like just tell them because there's no, <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, we, we should also mention in this final segment, again, we've, uh, kind of chat on the screenplay quite a lot throughout the episode but again we do get a couple of uh fun jt lines so in that con- first conversation you were talking about where you know he- he's saying like oh why don't you just um take him instead of giving back to roy um he comes out with this line and uh, when uh, karen says at least roy's his father at least he'll have a chance for a normal life with him and jt retorts normal What's not normal about getting on an airplane with your mam and going down to Rio with three million bucks? And then just before the reveal, <laughs> which is like really perfunctorily done, even though it's had all this build up, it's just kind of really rushed. And then Patrick's like, oh, OK, cool. You're my mom. Let's hug. Um, JT has this line. That's right. She's your mama. You're her son. We're rich. Let's go to Rio. Which, again, is pretty fun. <laughs> Yeah. And it seems like that would be the ending. But then they get on the plane. Like that even seems like a quick wrap up. But then they get on the plane and, you know, what it looks like maybe first class. And JT says that he wants to, you know, can he sit with her mom for a bit? Patrick moves up the seat or whatever. And so JT and her are sitting there with, you know, it's like the champagne they're wearing their disguises and, He's talking about 
you know, th- that nothing has ever gone right in his life, but here he is, the you know, with money and with the most beautiful woman he knows or whatever. It's supposed to be romantic, and then you hear the cops coming up, and you think, oh, well, they've been had, and that's what. But because we know the movie, and we kind of, I don't know, there no tension feels like it should be there, even though there's a part of you know, it's. And then the cops finally, they stop the plane, they enter, and she's about to give herself up. And then it he, or JT, is going to tell her that he loves her. And then um, it turns out that the cops just had an organ donor, or yeah, like a uh, some sort of organ for organ donation. And yeah. then they laugh and they hug, and then the plane flies off. And it, yeah, and that even feels really quickly wrapped up. <laughs> yeah, Every, everything about the ending feels uh, quite weird and abrupt. It's just kind of like. Um, yes, we've run out of story. Uh, we don't quite know what to do. Uh, we're going to have this one last moment of fake tension before you get the happy ending that you all know that you're going to get. Okay. Uh, sure, movie. Um, like, yeah, I think the movie could have, like, even though it would have been abrupt because, like, the kind of re- reveal to Patrick feels abrupt and it feels just kind of like so easily accept, accepted and just kind of like oh we've been building up this whole movie for this but it's just like oh okay cool done but like yeah you could have ended on that line with, with GT about like let's go to Rio and then that's kind of like a at least like a fun line um, to to end on um, and it it's weird as well because it feels like that would have dovetailed with the stop or my mum will shoot, which ends on the kind of he killed his mother, like that, you know, which also ends at an airport. Like uh, these guys, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh dear. They love they love airports. Yep. They they love airports and and making formulaic movies that are the most formulaic versions of the the movies that they're supposed to be then we had the most formulaic mismatched buddy comedy and now we found the most formulaic heist movie um all apologies to 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 mr william osborne and mr william davies i'm sure you're good people and um uh, one of them uh you know even co-wrote how to train your dragon so like you know not not you know did good stuff as well um yeah. but um you know like um these were not the high points of of anybody's uh career um it's not the high point of their career or russell mckay's career or any of the actors involved um the even the score is quite generic and like i looked up who did the score because i was like again i kind of thought like ah oh, it's probably just some gun for a hire composer and then i was like no it's it's brad fidel who did like the music for like terminator and terminator 2 and, and it's done other cool shit so like i get you know it's just not the high point for anybody everybody's everybody's it's a it's a lazy yeah. sunday afternoon movie <laughs> where it's just like ah uh, we, we we got through it except the one except like within stop or my mom will shoot where there's the one like PA or production designer, somebody <laughs> who's just so proud. Yeah, yeah. I want once again this this one random crew member. We don't know who that crew member was. Um, yeah, but you know the the assistant to Kim Basinger or something is like I remember back in '93. I was on the set of the Real McCoy. Still talk about those days, those heady days. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um. I suppose we should say that, like, again, um, this is not the most terrible movie in the world. There is the odd thing here and there to like about. Um, it's just yeah. much like Stubborn Mama it, it It is bogged down by its sheer genericness and also the kind of there's no real through line to the character of Karen. She kind of, sometimes she's really meek. Sometimes she's really badass. Sometimes she's, you know, sometimes she's really clever. Sometimes she's quite dumb. Like it, 
it's all yeah, it's all kind of mixed by you, you, there's different parts in the movie where she feels like a, a different character and yeah, and then tonally it can be quite weird. It moves in between this lighthearted crime caper romp and, and this, you know, more serious drama. And then we've kind of talked again about those two weird moments of violence that don't really fit with the other violence in the movie. Uh, yeah, it's just we got through it anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it. Yes, it is way better than um, you know. Step around, I'll shoot, and you know, watching it again. If I watched it outside of the this podcast and just came across it, where I didn't have to kind of, you know, wasn't going breaking down it scene by scene, I'd probably. I mean, it'd still be forgettable. It'd still be whatever, but I'd probably just it. You know, it'd be one of those. Maybe it. <laughs> never mind. It's gonna be say a two star movie, but maybe you know at least maybe not fully that. But it'd be something where you'd kind of be like, okay, you know, whatever. I it think it kind of is like time, a mediocre two star movie. It, like it was, I, it was. It, yeah. You know, yeah. like I, I genuinely think Stop on My Mouth is is like a kind of you know one one and a half star of disaster and i i don't yeah. i think this movie is more just kind of mediocre rather than like an out and out awful you know um horrible yeah 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 um but but uh Hopefully, uh, if you're, 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 this is your first episode, um, you know, you've, you've still enjoyed listening to us moan about this movie. Um, it also, if this is your first <laughs> episode listening, uh, we don't always moan like this. Sometimes we're way more chipper. Often we're way more chipper than this. And, um, yeah. Uh, sometimes you get some deeper uh, cinematic analysis that doesn't happen often usually it's just us kind of uh, riffing and joking but um, but certainly yeah certainly you can you can hear us in many other episodes in in a way more uh, upbeat moods and um, yeah ch- check out those episodes hopefully you've still enjoyed this this episode um, with us just kind of r- ranting uh, throughout throughout the episode and also uh, if you are offended uh, by swearing I realize I said the f word quite a lot in the first kind of half hour of this episode and um, <laughs> so so sorry that might seem excessive uh, to some so uh, so uh, apologies for that um, anyway uh, we need to wrap this one up so uh, Craig give the usual social media details and then I'll close the book on this one Yes, and for and actually, if you are just listening to for the first time, that yeah, surprisingly, this is the pre- we don't have a lot of swearing. I've realized in this um, no, traditionally in this podcast, despite some of the stuff we watched. <laughs> but um, I'll go into my details of if you want to look me up. Uh, I am on Twitter at Craig Dram D R A H E I M or instagram at craig.dram if you'd like to follow me or i am also part of bloodhound picks which is spelt p-i-x and you can find that on facebook twitter instagram or the website bloodhoundpicks.com where we are a podcast that look at obscure and or older obscure and independent kind of horror movies and then we'll also sometimes interview and highlight artists within the horror community be it reviewers from bloggers podcasters um, filmmakers or even um, scholars or whatever it may be and kind of talking about what it's like working in the the horror industry in this kind of modern age especially with the pandemic Um, but yeah if you're interested give me a follow and i recommend all our listeners uh check out 
uh, Bloodhound Picks and, and all that great stuff. If you want to listen to me talk more, you can on my other show, uh, New Horror Express, uh, which is uh, I interview uh, indie horror directors, uh, writers, actors, um, all, all, that, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's uh, a weekly show that's, uh, well, it was, it was a weekly show. It's, it's gone back to, to fortnightly uh, for now. Uh, but um, yeah, you can, you can check that out. Um, you can contact that show uh, on Twitter at New Horror EXP. Uh, New Horror Express also has a Facebook, so you can check out our Facebook. And I also have a website, uh, newhorrorexpress.com, which you can check that out. If you want to talk to me personally, uh, you can as well. You can hit me up on Twitter at Scott Murphy 85 Or if you want to hit up this show specifically, you can at 90s underscore all. But uh, yeah, so that's all the social media details. Also, before we uh, wrap this one up, um, if you if you do like the show, if you've listened, you liked it, then the best way you can support the show is to rate, review, and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen, wherever you're listening to the whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. That would help us out greatly. And if you could make those reviews five stars, that would be really helpful because otherwise the algorithm thinks we're shit. I know it's strange. We live in a strange world, but that's how it is. So five stars thank you very much and also if you really enjoy the show please tune in again next week when we will be talking all about batman forever and we're looking forward to that one because we've mentioned it in like five other episodes so it's like the most heavily trailed episode we've ever had so definitely check that one out but anyway that is all for this time until then See ya.